Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's July 12th. It's Tuesday, and welcome to Real Talk. Thanks for joining us, either live or later. Thanks oh, to like those that. of you that have, yeah, I, I came up with that a, little, a while ago. I was pretty proud of myself, and I just, I've just been waiting, just yeah. been waiting for the perfect opportunity to deploy the alliteration of live or later. I have to make a graphic for that. You got new headphones. I noticed it's like it's like when uh, when a, a you know a, lo- a couple that's lived together for a long time when yeah. one of the partners comes home and the other says, "Ooh, you got your hair done," mm. and then they earn ten points right out of the gates. I noticed immediately this morning. You had have new, you been working out? New cans, as they call them, uh, for a guy like you who makes his living in audio and production. It's awesome. These are the tools of the trade. Now people are going to look back and notice that you didn't notice that I've had these for. A couple of weeks, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? You never pay attention. But they're different to than the anymore. ones you were. They're different than the ones you were wearing yesterday. It's not the same. Yeah. Hey, uh, real talkers, we promise you more riveting conversation <laughs> like this. <laughs> At least an hour of it. Erica Eiffel is going to join us in about ten minutes' time. I believe that Erica's probably in Ottawa this morning. I saw that she was tweeting. She's uh, she's uh, she says she's pretty excited to be uh, joining Real Talk. She says doing Alberta radio is a whole different vibe altogether. And so I can't wait to find out what she means by that. What's your guess? What do, what do you think it, what do you think know? it means? I think I think it means that I'll, I'll, you know when when you talk to uh as we call ourselves like a prairie podcast, uh, a west coast forum for conversation and debate, uh, maybe it's just I don't know, is it more spirited? I don't think so. Do westerners have more of a sp- I don't think so. Anyway, she's already given out a shout to a shout out to Ross Shep, which is a a, a well-populated high school in our hometown of Edmonton and so Erica knows what's up. She's been all over the place and I want to talk to her about a ton of things. She's been tweeting if you follow Erica, uh you know that she's been super quite frankly, what's the appropriate phrase for it? Pissed off about the Rogers outage. And uh, we'll get to her take on that. Cost of living, want to talk about affordability. And then she does great work when it comes to uh, equity and inclusion as a political commentator. She writes in Canada's National Observer, The Hill Times, and a bunch of other uh, uh, platforms uh, talking about equity and inclusion. And she's been pretty critical of the federal government. And I want to get into specifically why. Mo Amir, the host of This Is Van Color, is going to join us in about a half an hour's time. Uh, Mo out of British Columbia. That's the province playing host right now, of course, to the annual Premier's Gathering. Yeah. It's being chaired by BC's Premier John Horgan who announced a while ago, for health reasons, will not be seeking re-election. Canada's Premier is coming together with a a couple of top priorities. This is basically where they all try to get on the same page, and that is in opposition. Not really, but they they try to make life uh, more difficult or call out or put the onus on the federal government to fund important things. Uh, A big one uh, that they were talking about yesterday, said Premier Horgan, and we'll get to that in just a bit with Mo Amir, is affordability. But the number yeah. one thing Canada's premiers are looking for funding on is health care. The federal government saying right now, well, listen, you guys already have a ton of dough, and, and you're, you know, they're, they're, the federal government, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, is kind of, I won't say smearing the premiers, because it's all gamesmanship, and we love it. I mean, this is what politics is all about. But the position of the federal government uh, is that the, the numbers are being fudged by the premiers. The, the, the funding scenario is not as inequitable as it would appear to be. Uh, so how much progress will the premiers make? Uh, you know, which of their priorities is probably most doable, most achievable, et cetera, most keeping an eye on that. We'll ask him for his take on the federal conservative leadership. And also Mo's show, This is Van Color. Running on Czech News. You remember Czech? We were talking course, to yeah. Linda Steele and Jody Vance a few Fridays ago. Mm-hmm. Their show just announced there. It's, it's employee-owned TV station out on Vancouver Island, which is a really neat model. So I'd love to pick Mo's brain on that, too. When I was out in Kelowna, I watched Czech. It's great. It's yeah. Got, it's got, like, this down-home feel that, like, kind of the news has gotten away from lately. Like, it feels... it really feels local when you're watching it. Yeah. Is it is it kind of the vibe, although I don't know if you were in Alberta at the time, John. I don't even think you were, but you remember like way back in the day before they were branded City TV, before they were acquired by by uh, Chum cool. and then by Bell Globe Media and then by Rogers, City TV, City TV got passed around a whole bunch. I was there. That's I think there before were, my time. There were three yeah. or four ownership changes in, mm-hmm. in the span of you know maybe five or six years. But when they first came, A-Channel, 
and they were the ones to sort of first have the uh, the video journalists out there, the VJs, and so no longer did reporters have like a camera operator, certainly not a sound engineer. They just went out, shot their own stuff. Uh, they were also kind of the first, like 10 or 15 years later, for the reporters to be shooting selfie-style reporter stand-ups, as you call them, ah, so out in the field. Which is what everyone does now. Yeah, it's what everybody does. So were they ahead of their time? I don't know. It Part of it had Seems to like do it. with certainly lean budgets and efficiencies, but it also is a style of storytelling like you're talking about with Jack. For sure, yeah. And uh, I just felt like oh, there's this one guy on there who had been there forever. But, yeah, just very like you could tell the the reporters put a lot into each story. It was personalized. I feel like, yeah, I feel like reporters do way more than – uh, they're being paid for these days. Oh, man. Well, I mean, it used to be you just went somewhere, you turned on, like, you had a camera guy, you had someone in your ear, you had someone possibly writing for you, editing. Yeah. They're doing all of that now, right? Yeah, for, for sure. everything. Yeah, from for top sure. To bottom. Yeah, and... and uh, just like you. Nobody... <laughs> well, and, and it's kind of funny to get into this because, really, uh, I don't mean nobody cares. That's not the right way to, to frame it. But if you, if you sit there and say, well, journalists are being paid less than they have before to do more and work. to do twice or three times as much work to file, you know, with more immediacy. And we've talked about this on the show before, how this demand for we talked about this with Peter Mansbridge uh, to drop a big name. Remember when he joined us a while ago and, and Mansbridge was talking about it? Mm -hmm. And same with Lyndon McIntyre, the storyteller, longtime storyteller multiple Gemini Award wins for TV and, and for storytelling in Canada. Of course, for his work on uh, uh, on a number of different CBC programs, uh, really just uh, Lyndon McIntyre was talking to us about his new book when he was out. But, but yeah. they were talking about this this need, you know, and Lyndon was kind of chewing on it. You can check our archives for this podcast archives, YouTube, YouTube. I recommend you check it out. But he was talking about his work on the Fifth Estate in particular. And so you'd be assigned a story and you'd have. You know, you, you could have days or maybe even some circumstances, even weeks or months to work on a big investigative story and get it right. But the expectations now, the demand is just content, content, content. And so you've got to be producing all the time and churning stuff out all the time. And you wonder what that does to the quality. Well, and the depth of it. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious to pick Mo Amir's brain on that kind of stuff. Is it too early to announce who we're talking to tomorrow because I'm already so excited about this. Do can, do we have the video locked and loaded out of out of uh, Kyrgyzstan? Is that uh, you we know do. what I'm talking? Do we want to we, we show who we're talking has, has about, or do we want to show the video? Well, let's first? show the video first because this is this is making the rounds. You can't ignore it. It's probably you know you. I doubt you follow this guy on Instagram because uh, up until just a couple of days ago he was. Just a guy. Uh, his name is Harry Shimon, and he's with his friends, and they're traveling. Uh, they're they're on a remarkable journey through East Asia right now. And uh, Harry managed to capture this video. Why don't we roll it? I'll, I'll explain it for people listening on the podcast. You can hear this. Have you seen this one? This ice avalanche that's coming down in in Kyrgyzstan. It's it's trending it's all over the place. Millions of views. Literally millions of views. It it appears to be. Uh, from quite a distance away, but here it comes, right? And it's roaring in, it's rolling, and this this camera phone is just capturing it on video rather calmly. It's and then here closer. <laughs> here's here, here's where he realizes, yeah, he goes, oh shit, and here's where he realizes what's about to happen, and uh, you, it looks like it's slowing down for a second until it's you realize it's all. absolutely <laughs> not at all. Oh, and check this out. Oh dear God. You know, I mean, for people watching on YouTube, the video speaks for itself. And there's this ice avalanche roaring over him. Of course, he survives. And people have had a whole bunch of, like, well, you know, that guy shouldn't have put... They've got all these sort of comments on it. And, you know, what's he doing? Putting himself in this sort of a thing. So I reached out to him on a, just on a flyer yesterday. And I said, uh, we would love to talk to you about shooting that video and about your journey overall and just what it's been like. And, and uh, he says, how's Wednesday? Nice. So he's going to join us tomorrow. I'm really excited about this. So we'll be able to hear straight from the guy that shot that video that, that literally, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, millions of views over the course of the first 24 hours that he posted it. He has one of these obligatory posts up now. He says to all my new Instagram followers, because, you know, this goes when somebody posts something like that. And then all of a sudden their follower count goes from, I don't know, 6,000 to like 50,000 overnight. So that's a great conversation coming up tomorrow. But between now and then, a lot of ground to cover. I've got some emails 
uh, ready to go from from Jordan, who talked to us about our interview with RCMP Sergeant Kerry Shima. Parents, do you know who your kids are talking to online? A great email from Jordan. We want to get to Maurice writing in about the Pope's visit to Alberta coming up to apologize for residential schools. And Neil wrote us uh, an email as well to talk at RyanJesperson.com about uh, I still can't believe this when I say it. It just seems so, you know, uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, his, uh, you know, I mean, his his life still being celebrated. Do you say his death, his murder mm. uh, being mourned in Japan right now? It's an ongoing ceremony, of course, for a nation just absolutely shocked by the assassination of its former leader at a campaign event. You remember the morning that we reported that it had just happened. And I, I went back and listened to it. I watched our coverage of it. Cause I was just, we were just, I was rattled by that. It had just happened overnight. This guy was uh, a major player in international relations. And of course uh, in Japan, especially we talked about this, a country that is for all intents and purposes, totally unfamiliar with gun violence. It got us talking about guns. It got us talking about countries like Japan. That's a nine, gun deaths in 2018 125 million people nine gun deaths versus the united states that had about 38,000 gun deaths in that same year double the population neil wrote in just to talk about where he wants the conversation to go when it comes to gun ownership and especially in canada we value those opinions these conversations happen because of our sponsors that, that each and every week show up to essentially ensure that people are talking about the things that matter and that includes the team at apex automation we're so excited to have them partnering with us apex automation right now putting the call out to engineers across the country are you feeling like you know maybe in your current situation you're limited when it comes to reaching your true potential would you like to help companies clients become more efficient more profitable and have a company that recognizes you do that by putting the best team of people together? Are you looking to achieve great things? Well, today could be the day that you make your move to work for Apex Automation at apexautomation.ca. You can learn more about available career opportunities. What's open right now? Uh, Check out their flexible hours, their professional development opportunities, and uh, a corporate culture that's unlike a lot of other engineering firms. Trust me when I say that. Apex Automation is providing fully autonomous solutions, intuitive ones, to industry. They're giving people back their time. Our friends at Friesen Brothers. (laughs) We're just... Every time I see Friesen Brothers right now, I get this visceral reaction from you. I feel like now you, we're all in. We've fully switched from our, I won't even say our old You grocery. found your new religion. We're in. We're 100% in. So all right. What's what's one which other is thing? Every time we go there, we're just like, they have so many options for us. I can't wait to introduce you to their Because we're the plant lead, eaters. We're the grass. Team. We're the dirt yeah, yeah, eaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Picked up a vegan Caesar there last night, just on the way home. Just had to grab it. Just nice and convenient. How was the vegan Caesar? It was incredible. And you can get, look in the back. There's plant-based chicken you can get on it as well. There's the option. And then I turn around and right behind me, I see the uh, local. Have you tried the El Gringo salsa? Love the El Gringo salsa. The pineapple salsa, the mango salsa. Got this for the wife because she's a mango maniac. And then... uh, made another 90 degree turn boom oh yeah sure there's some local troubled monk brew yeah craft Craft beer four pack and that was that was about five minutes in freezing oh my gosh yeah you gotta you gotta be careful in there yeah i'm one of those people that i go in with the basket and then i make the transfer to the cart you know (laughs) when you're real sometimes i'll go from one basket to two and then to the cart Nah, we've all been there. Friesen Brothers in 16 Alberta communities. Uh, don't forget, on the first of every month, it's 15% off. That's a huge deal. Every grocery order of $75 or more. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Looking forward to connecting with uh, Erica Eiffel. She's been on the show before. Uh, an absolute riot. And uh, I just love it because Erica is one of those people you will never say, and, and, and I don't think that she'll take any issue with this assessment. People will never wa- say, I wonder how Erica feels about this. Uh, she's quite uh, well articulated in uh, not just the podcast platforms, but also in writing, in columns. You've probably seen her work in the Hill Times, in McLean's National Observer, The Globe and Mail. Uh, she founded Not In My Color, which is a consultancy that uh, takes organizations 
transitions from meaningful conversations to systemic change in equity and anti-racism. And she's also co-host of the Bad and Bitchy podcast. It's so good to have you back on the show. Good morning. Hello. Uh, I was uh, Johnny and I were laughing. I had a big smile on my face when uh, when you tweeted a while ago. You said I'm about to hop on Real Talk, and you said doing Alberta is a whole different vibe. And I it said, I, yeah, I can't wait to ask what you mean by that. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I was um, interviewed by another reporter on Friday. It's like the only <laughs> it's the only um, call I got during the Rogers meltdown, mm, yeah. right? So. Uh, I was talking to him. It was just so easy. We were vibing. There was none of this. There was none of this veneer of propriety. Uh It was just two people talking. And uh, I was like, this is really wild. Like, this is really easy to you're really easy to talk to. He's like, I'm from Calgary. I said, oh, that explains it. (laughs) You're from the West. And people when you talk to people in Ontario, if they have, it's like they have to perform professionalism. Mm. You know what I mean? Like they have to have a veneer of some sort of, I am to be taken seriously as a professional. Mm. So they'll talk to you with this weird kind of almost robotic way. Mm. It's weird. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like when you see a lot of professional athletes, particularly in hockey, get yes. interviewed and it's just yeah. like it's the most boring interview of all time i love you're like why Who i love i'm like just let, let let me tell you what he's about to say right now he's about <laughs> to, yeah, about to say you got to play the full 60 minutes full 200 games you gotta play both. <laughs> exactly. and no, nobody cares about this interview uh, exactly. Do you think maybe the I mean, you're a podcaster yourself, obviously co-host mm-hmm. of, of Bad and Bitching. You've done a lot of other media. Do you, do you think that maybe the, the proliferation of podcasts, um, maybe the, the access to platforms for a, a lot of people that, that that maybe haven't typically had access to those platforms, but certainly have hot takes? Do you think that's maybe changing the the, the entire way or the entire tone of how stories are told or, or issues are dissected? Oh, new media is leading the way because if you think of, for example, explainer articles, Mm. that wasn't a thing before, right? And because news moves so fast, and I find that Vox started this first when they said, uh, when they started out their um, explainer pieces that just, um, just caught people up to topics. And I just think there's a freer way of, telling a story than a typical way that news people have been used to. Um, So the way we would tell a story, for example, is we always start out with the story and uh, we always have some sort of of commentary along those lines. And uh, because we we know politics and we know policy, because we both worked for the Federal Public Service, we know how that works. And so, you know, sometimes you interject with your own story. It's very personal. I find that media now is more customized and more personalized Mm. to tone to to the audience that they're serving. Because if you if you look at if you've ever been to like um, any sort of discussion on new media and how to gain followers and stuff. It's all about serving your community. Yeah. And I think new media thinks of their listeners more as a community than an audience per se. It's it's more it's more give and take rather than just consumption. I totally agree with you. Yeah. We we talked to Connie Walker yesterday. Uh, oh yay. Oh my gosh. She is just Oh, right? I am a fan. Did you, yes. you you obviously I'm I'm assuming by your enthusiasm you've checked out Stolen. Uh, surviving St. Michael's, and she, I was, I was saying to her, I haven't I, finished it yet, though. I won't, okay. there, I won't, uh, I won't say anything. Um, but and it, that was kind of part of the challenge yesterday in talking to her because I had so many specific things I wanted to ask her about the podcast, this eight episode podcast on Spotify. Well, but at the same time, I don't want to destroy it for people that haven't yet had a chance to check it out. But the point I wanted to make with her is, uh, in in particular, what a personal exercise to to sort of do a deep dive into her dad, her uncle, her aunts, her grandparents' experiences in residential schools, and then yeah. ultimately through the through the journalistic exercise, which was a number of months. I can't even imagine how many interviews, how many hundreds of hours of work went into it, but she, she ends up um, you know, really contemplating the intergenerational impact of or what residential schools did to to her and the impact that residential yeah. schools are having on her daughter 
right? But the, and this sort of you know reiterates that idea of, of this trauma, in, yeah. intergenerational trauma. And, and anyway, I just applauded Connie yesterday because it's just remarkable to have such a personal thing uh, there. You you wear your heart on the sleeve on your sleeve all the time, which I love. I want to remind people you're you're a journalist. Yeah, you're also an economist, so it gives you yeah. kind of an interesting perspective in dissecting issues. But but it became very apparent over the past few days you were one of millions of people across the country losing their minds because they're Rogers customers and none of their shit was working. And you on your pot your platform on Twitter calling for the CEO to step down. Have things calmed down for you? Or are you happy now with the way that no. things? Are- because, no, I know you're not. No, because because naturally Roger screwed up my data. Okay. Oh. And they're telling me I used all this data on Saturday, and I'm looking. I'm telling them there's no way that I did. Listen, fighting with Rogers for them to be accurate is like an Ontario pastime. I feel <laughs> um, it is. It is one of the worst companies to deliver services ever. And, you know, you guys have tell us, like, you know what I mean? Well, I've been, so, hey, hang on a second. Charles Adler was under this impression. Yes, he doesn't think that anybody in, or was it Chuck that said this, John? I don't remember who said it. Someone's like, well, do, do people in Western Canada even use Rogers? I said a ton of people in Western Canada use ton Rogers. Of people. Well, I was on it for years. Yeah, you're on it for years. Yeah, so it's uh, there were a lot of people in Alberta too, BC, I saw that were just handcuffed this weekend. There is no, look, cash is king, okay? That's what I learned on friday yeah cash is still king but do you still carry cash interact was out yeah there was no interact but who has cash right so thankfully i i don't want to shout out this bank but thankfully i bank with a bank <laughs> that that to be fair you know can never do anything right mm-hmm. okay td can never <laughs> do anything right but they have a bank machine on every corner so you don't have to go very far. So that was okay. But cash is now king again. Who knew? Yeah, who knew? Um, a lot of families, I mean, I, I'm curious. I, I'd give you the heads up on this. The, just as an economist, I'm always curious for your take on this, but also just as like a real-life human, um, mm. you know, going through day-to-day. Right now, you talk to people across Canada. Obviously, people have uh, the issues that matter most to them. If someone's just had a, a cancer diagnosis, that's what they care about. That, that's what makes the most sense. If their dog just passed away, that's what they care about most that yeah. day. But for all intents and purposes, people right now are trying to figure out how to navigate uh, this economy right now with inflation, like almost triple what people are used to. The cost of living is getting out of control. I mean, the price of gas, no matter where you look across the country. My uncle in Vancouver tells me that it was two sixty five the other day for regular. Like it's just people. I mean, people can't even really understand how they're going to navigate this uh, as a citizen and as an economist. What are you keeping an eye on in the context of cost of living right now? Um. Housing, definitely. Mm. I want to see how the interest rates are going to affect um, housing demand and how rising interest rates are going to. Is it going to dampen that? I don't know. I, I think we're really in weird, unprecedented times right now. I know people say that, but, you know, this pandemic isn't over also. Um, and we're going to, con- which means we're probably going to have to c- continue to get those supply chain issues. And it just goes to show what we should be thinking about is how much we um, oriented our economy towards efficiency. And efficiency and agility are what economists would call orthogonal, which means they're basically at opposite ends. Um, With more efficiency, you have to give up agility and that ability to maneuver. And what we've seen in sort of supply chain and supply chain models is that um, once one part breaks, uh, it it wrecks the whole thing. So uh, there are a number of things happening. uh, I can, of course, the war in um, Ukraine is a big factor. Um, The pandemic is a big factor. Uh, I know that governments are probably reticent to open their wallet or open the the um the fiscal floodgates for people again uh if the pandemic it's a no-go right so all of the instruments we used before are a political no-go if this pandemic wave becomes worse yeah and i like to state the obvious i know that i'm not the only person paying attention people are 
talking about a sixth wave, seventh wave. People are talking about the, yeah. you know, the hospitalizations are, are starting to uptick across the country again. I think I saw yesterday. I mean, at its peak within the last year or so, I think the, 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 the highest number of people that were hospitalized at COVID were about, at, say, 25% of where the absolute peak was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, that number is not negligible. And I know a lot of people right now, we're hearing from people that are telling us that they haven't been wearing a mask for several months now, and now they're going back to it again. And it's just been an interesting reminder. We have a lot of conversations with people like you, Erica, experts in in the economy and in business and in commerce and in, and in trade. And they talk about this, these, you know, these post-pandemic recoveries or the post-pandemic action plans that mm. finance ministers around the world are tasked with and the messaging behind that. And then you take a look around you and you go, I'm not so sure that the factors impacting this hurting or lagging uh, or supercharged economy based on your perspective are, are wrapped up. I think it's we're still kind of in the midst of the storm a little bit. I think the whole idea of the post pandemic is a political one. I think that a lot yeah. of leaders uh, didn't know what to do, especially when Omicron hit. Uh, a lot of uh, I, I, there was a leadership failure and they want to change the channel. They want to move on. And so you didn't hear much of it in the Ontario election about the pandemic. It, it, it was wild. It was it was as though it never really happened or it happened like three years ago. And um, and so politically, yes, um, politicians don't want to deal with the pandemic. They want to deal with recovery. They want to deal with they want to go back to the same old things they were talking about before the pandemic. But life does not move like that and people will suffer and our public services will continue to suffer and people, um, citizens, uh, when I say citizens, I mean the citizenry, not necessarily immigration status or anything like that, um, will feel that loss of services. So even in the summer now, uh, you want to, you want to get away. You have to wait in line for a day, day and a half for a passport. Mm. So we can, we can see the degradation of our public services. And I think that that's a big issue that we're not talking about right now that is pandemic related and that is affordability related because we need our institutions to be able to respond um i don't know how people are paying for gas i thankfully live close to downtown ottawa yeah um so i can walk to downtown to be honest and many times i do uh everybody's gonna have to take out a lot of credit just to drive around to be honest and that is due to of course a war and geopolitical reasons but i also think if we didn't have a war we'd have gas prices would go up yeah i'm I'm never i'm never convinced when people point to like the reason behind yeah a lot of things no i i really think that gas i think that it is part of the same sort of storm that's happening yeah in this post pandemic world, I, I, I think that the Russian Ukraine or the Russian invasion is part of the story. I think that the reason, one of the reasons why it's going up, it probably explains the amplitude mm-hmm. or part of the amplitude, but it would still have an amplitude, I think, in absence of that war. My next door neighbor tells me just the other day they were pulling their trailer out with their kids. And he said after after two and a half, three hours on the highway, he says he looked at his gas gauge and he said, I thought camping was supposed to be the cheap option. Cheaper version. Right? <laughs> yeah. He's like, why are we yeah. just flying somewhere and staying in swanky hotels? It's going to cost them the same. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you're into climate, what does that mean for climate? Right. Mm. Climate yeah. very much. Our response to climate is very much economically based. If we pay too much for gas, of course, we're not doing car- we're not doing climate. That's how it works. Yeah. Well, you I know. mean, you know, people have talked. We're, we're fickle with that. Is what I'm saying. Well, there and there has to be incentives. Like we, you know, we have a solar panel partner, Kubi Energy, that that we partner mm-hmm. with, and it's interesting. I was talking to their CEO the other day, and cost is coming down big time on solar installations and the infrastructure mm-hmm. he said and uh, jake tells me jake kubiski says one of the things that was really interesting he says 10 years ago people that were putting solar panels on their roofs were not doing it with any sort of impetus of, of cost efficiency or saving money they were doing it out of conviction
fiction. They yeah. wanted they wanted to do their part to live bless more sustainably, people. right? And bless those yeah. people. That's awesome. That's yeah. fantastic. He said, but what's contributed to like an influx, why you see way more solar now in neighborhoods is because now people can justify it financially. And for yeah. most people, I don't think that's a that's not a bad thing. That's just a reality for most people. What matters most to them is their household's bottom line. Exactly. And, you know, I am a believer in incentives like that's how gov- that's part of what government does. It creates incentives to get us to switch our consumption one way or another. Hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that we are we will build that infrastructure to expand that those options, too, because I think what we need to start doing is we need to start giving people um, exactly what you're saying, those options away from your fossil fuels to be able to heat their home, to be able to do all those things. And if there's one thing Alberta has, it's sky. <laughs> <laughs> you're from it. You went to Ross Shep, right? You, you're, I did. You, so you did you grow up in Edmonton? I did. I grew up in Edmonton. And then when did you move? How long have you been in Ottawa? What brought you to Ottawa? Uh, I did my master's in Calgary. Okay. And then I got a job out in Ottawa at the federal government. And uh, I've been here ever since. Yeah. W- would you ever move back? But I come, I come back regularly. Would you, would you move back West or are you, are you, I never say never. Yeah. Yeah. I never say never. Ottawa's a special city though. I lived there one it's summer. It's special. <laughs> <laughs> were you bracing, uh, it, were you bracing yourself for July 1st? I was. I was. Because nobody knew Uh, what was going to happen. No, but I rode my bike down to Parliament Hill. See, I live close enough to Parliament Hill to that to do that, too. I live in a good spot, to be honest. Well, not so well, not so great, because anyway, bad things have happened here, too. But anyway, all this to say, um, I rode my bike down to Parliament Hill. Uh, Here's what I saw. Um. The regular sort of, you know, yay Canada people, as you see on the hill every year, were there, mixed in with convoy people, mixed in with, I found that there was a big Christian presence this year. And that was something new that I had not seen before. Like, I don't remember seeing uh, Bible verses on placards on Canada Day. And which Bible uh, verses? I I I don't know. I feel like I feel like it was Proverbs. <laughs> I feel like okay. it was something from Proverbs. You know, as long as it wasn't would, Revelation, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, that, that's what they might have been saying on the mic. Yeah. Uh, because you know, and that is interesting to me because um the marriage of the far right and the Christian right is um is is typical it's it's it says to me that that the far right is rising and um it's showing up with its allies on parliament hill i think we have a problem i will always say that i think we have a huge problem and i don't think we're talking about it enough Hmm. well and that problem is the rise of the far right yeah uh i totally agree with you and uh we uh we don't have to rap. Like I asked you, I asked you for 20 minutes of your time. We don't have to rap because when somebody, no, I'm good. when a guest on the show says something like you just said, I, and I agree. I, yeah. So let's, let's talk about it yeah, Okay. Uh, because I think that um, it, it demands a conversation we saw in the United well, States. I mean, we've had just to stay, say one obvious thing, um, the assertion that many people, um, I'm about to open up a can of worms by using of a certain, course you are. A, a certain yes. word. No, Let's we're in front. Of, I know you. I know you personally <laughs> cannot stand the word centrist. Um, yeah. But 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 I think a lot of so-called centrists over the past five or ten years have said, you know, for example, Supreme Court in the U.S. is never going to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's not ever going to happen. Uh, and then all of a sudden. Ooh, uh, over the course of a few years and stacking the courts and et cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows the backstory. Look where we are now. And you see developments in Canada. And I don't blame anybody for wondering if the same sort of a rights rollback might happen here or at least be attempted here. And and I do think that, you know, to speak in first responders terms, it's it should be a, a five alarm response right now. I think people should be alarmed yeah. and paying attention. Well, we just had... Um you know, MPs that met with convoy leadership 
uh, you know, and and they got a tour. <laughs> like they got a tour of parliament. The same people who wanted to overthrow the government got a tour of parliament. And that is analogous to um, the Republican congressman. I think his name was Barry Loudermilk or something like that. He gave a tour to the insurrectionists on Capitol Hill. I mean, those two things are analogous. And so it's funny because today is the uh, January 6th hearing, I believe. Mm. And uh, they're continuing with that. But the same forces that are shaping up in the U.S. I mean, why wouldn't they form here? I mean, the 49th parallel, like I said, has been a very porous border for history. And we've had many of similar histories. Well, and, and I think that, that you know, activists, if you want to call them that, uh, whatever the word is, you know, the, the people become emboldened regardless of where they stand on the spectrum or what their issue is. They become emboldened if they see other jurisdictions, including other nations, move on something, policy or otherwise. And so you see it mm-hmm. happen in the States. And that's something that you recognize could happen here or could be doable here. I mean, hey, how about one of the stories that's broken over the past little bit? I mean, I wonder about the political liability, maybe not political liability, but former Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall, right? Police subpoenaing phone records as part of a prosecution against a convoy organizer. They find that Saskatchewan's former premier has exchanged 25 text messages with them, counseling them on on organizing this convoy. And you kind of go, like, understanding how these things work behind the scenes, Wow. I mean, treason's a thing, right? Like, I, <laughs> I, I mean, sure. I mean, everybody's throwing treason around right now, though. The convoy. Know, are, you know. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me put it to you this way. How disloyal can you be? Really? It's funny to me how uh, immigrants of color will be, will be, um, will be asked over and over about their loyalty to this country. Jagmeet Singh, for example, is a good example of that. I remember when Terry Molesky asked him about his loyalty to Canada. I remember when Dr. Tam's loyalty was questioned uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Not even Derek was. So, I, that's still, that's still is, goes on. Yeah, it is. is. Yeah. But why aren't we questioning Brad Wall's loyalty to this country? Well, you know why, Erica? Because people that support the convoy spin it as the ultimate act of patriotism. Right. The, the, the people that organized the convoy would accuse you and I of being disloyal for criticizing uh, their efforts to, 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 you know, celebrate and champion and preserve the freedom of everybody to make their own. Right. Who asked them for that? I didn't ask them for that. Why are they acting for me? Don't I have a freedom of thought, speech, all of that? I don't need to to um, substitute one overseer for another. That is my point. I don't like, I mean, one has seemingly checks and balances and the other is just a group of ragtag whomevers. I mean, that have no legitimacy. Again, where is the legitimacy? In what? In the convoy? Yeah. Where is it? Well, I where, mean, I, why, 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 why are they, what is, what, I, I don't want to, I don't want to even between somebody like a reporter on Twitter talking about how Tamara Litch is a political prisoner. I, I, oh, you're I'm talking really about Stephen Marr. Oh, you're oh talking God. about Stephen Marr. Oh we don't have God. Mo Amir. We should just bring Mo in as a panelist. We should just turn this we into really a we, we, we got, we, I, just, I feel like me and Mo know, need to be on. Do you know Mo? Together. Let's bring it. Let's bring him in for a second. I get yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll he give him a, just, uh, I'll give him a proper introduction. He's literally he, just texting me saying, Erica's on fire. When yeah, can I get in? Yeah. Like, let's just yeah, bring. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah, the, yeah, I love doing this. This is the best part about doing a show like this is, is we can oh. just sort of shift on the fly. So, so Listen, we'll, we'll figure you, out the logistics show, here. Your show makes me friends, by the way. I love to hear that. No, love, no. Your show makes me friends. Seriously. That's amazing, Erica. Yeah. The, the only reason yeah. why we're not seeing Erica on screen right now is because John's getting Mo into the shot. So let me introduce him. Mo Amir is the creator, the creator and host of This Is Van Color. It's a, a BC-focused culture and politics podcast. He's been doing it for more than four years now, and uh, is just wrapping up its first season as a TV talk show on oh, Check cool. News. Super cool. Um, <laughs> and, and Mo does a whole bunch of stuff, and, and he, he, you hear him on the CBC Radio <laughs> One. He's a columnist for Vancouver. Is awesome. Mo, let's see your beautiful face this morning how are you yeah. pal? Good, oh, to, yes. good to see you 
Thank you so much. What an honor. Um, Ryan, first of all, it, just an honor that uh, you even took notice of me while I sit here in Vancouver. Oh, come on. But a, a bigger honor that um, that I can be on your show. And to be on with Erica, too. I mean, I'm, I hope season two at some point, both of you will will be on the TV show. So I look forward to that. Well, I've yeah. already I've already yeah. told you I'm that I'm confirmed. So and yeah, you know, Erica <laughs> will do it. it. Yeah, let's I'll do, do it. it. Told it. Um, totally. So this this will be the crossover. Um, and, and Erica, by the way, we're not going to I, I still want to ask you about a, a column that you wrote. I want to ask you about your piece on the liberals on a collision course to entrench anti-blackness. I want to get to that oh, yeah, before yeah, yeah. we thank you for your time. But Mo, yes. what do you make of what we're talking about with the convoy? Like, what's your stance on this? Erica says, where's its legitimacy? And I'm going I'm kind of having a hard time answering that question because that's not where my focus has been but but how have you approached the whole thing over the last i mean like year yeah i mean i think if you're a resident of ottawa you you are rightfully upset and you your life is probably being uh disrupted by some of these uh these pro quote unquote protests uh, legitimacy i don't know i mean I, I kind of am in the camp that i think people are allowed to to protest, but sure, yeah. yeah, I draw the line when it comes to hate speech or when you are severely disrupting the day-to-day -day lives of people. And, you know, maybe an unpopular hot take, but, you know, here in BC, we deal with save old growth protesters that shut down, um, you know, main arteries and, and bridges and really affect, you know, day-to-day -day working class people. And so I'm not on board with that. And I, I think the repercussions should be doled out uh, in an equitable way as it would for other people. Um, it, I think it's a dangerous political potato to play with, as some politicians have, and I know you alluded to that before I joined. Um, and so I don't know if if you really want to put your weight behind, you know, the freedom convoy and, and being being on that team because you have some ugly, ugly uh, characters involved in, in a lot of these protests. And so uh, the conservatives, some conservatives are kind of playing with that. Will it come to bite them in the butt? Uh, I'm sure the, the federal liberals and others are, are certainly hoping so. Yeah, I don't know. Erica, I don't know if you saw, I was uh, talking to Sapria Devetti on Friday and we were uh, talking. Sapria, oh, yes. she, What a beauty. And we're, we're, we're talking about whether or not it is, you know, I mean, is it, uh, you know, uh, sort of something that could stand in the way. Let's say, let's assume Pierre Polyev wins the conservative leadership. I, I think that that's a foregone conclusion. And let's assume that he and the conservatives give the liberals a good run for their money in the next federal election, which I think is a fair assumption. Let's assume, they will. you know, so, so could this, could his support of the convoy stand in the way of him becoming prime minister? And I'm sitting there asserting mm, that I, I have a hard time. I don't, I don't necessarily think so. Well, that's I, and the thing. Sabrina doesn't either. I, I, I'm very realistic about this country, like <laughs> very realistic. And it's one thing to protest. It's another thing to occupy, you know, and that, that became an occupation and it became, um, a siege really, as even the Ottawa police called it that. But, uh, I, I'm here for protests. I really am great, but not an occupation. And uh what it did is it 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 barred people it barricaded people in their homes the people who couldn't get out of downtown ottawa had to stay they were either afraid of the convoy or afraid of the cops so um because that's the other thing is that the cops and the convoy are very much interlinked the auto they're members of the ottawa police that supported the convoy financially so we are kind of stuck in a place now where you don't know who your neighbor is anymore. You know, you don't, that's where we are. And I, I feel as though this is probably what the 19, it just feels like the precursor to something. I believe Pierre Polyev could, could become prime minister. I believe our next election could be uh, much like the American election in 2016. Um, and it could have the same results, especially if I'm going to say it, Christopher Freeland runs. I think it's going to turn out. I think Pierre Polyev is going to win. I, uh, I, I, uh, and we've had, uh, you know, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland on the show several can times. I just, yeah. Can I just say this? Sure. Tying it back to the affordability crisis. This is the perfect storm. The affordability crisis um, another wave of a pandemic and that anxiety and uncertainty that we have right now in our society. I think it's the perfect storm for things like misinformation, rise of, of, of more extreme groups 
and things like that. I, I think I think this country's tearing apart at the seams. Can I can I add something here? Like I, I'm going to add a personal anecdote, and I'm going to cite my dad, Mo Senior. Uh, he was a big Pierre Polyev fan. He was one of those people that was sharing the WhatsApp videos and talking about printing money and you know a variety of different issues that really resonated with him. But then when Polyev came out and you know supported the the Freedom Convoy, or at least what he deemed to be the legal aspects of the protest. Uh, even my dad was like, he was like, oh no, I thought he was one of the good ones. Like <laughs> he, kind of, he kind of, you know, walked back a little bit of his support. And he might, you know, my dad is kind of all over the map politically. He's a bit of a, he resonates with populist politics. Um, he's not a Trudeau guy. He really is uh, disaffected by the, the Trudeau government. Um, but now he's having second thoughts about, you know, will he put his full weight behind uh, a Pierre Polyev uh, conservative party. And I do wonder how many people, particularly in urban ridings, who are concerned about affordability, as Erica noted, and who, who, um, who, who you know, when pol populist politics speak to them generally, I wonder how they will look at this and, and go, yeah, you know, like we're also a little bit resistant to bringing back some lockdowns, but we definitely do not want to be associated with uh, some of these characters in the protest. So, we still have to see how this all fleshes out. I hope that there are no, you know, serious incidents or or things that really affect um, the day-to-day -day lives of people. But but ultimately, yeah, this is a very fine line that I think the conservatives are walking and it might turn off a lot of supporters that they want to bring in and that they will need in order to form government. And I think that, that both of you are bang on in your assessments, but here's the gist of what Sapria says on Friday on the show, people can go back and check out that interview, of course, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of wondering aloud to where, well, what's this going to do for the so-called progressive conservative faction, the moderates, right? The, you know, the average person in an urban riding that that would love to vote conservative, be inclined to in, in maybe a Toronto suburb Mo, or a Vancouver suburb where you are obviously extremely important ridings. Uh, and I say they're going to be just like you're saying, Mo, they're going to be turned off by this kind of stuff. They're not going to vote. Sabrina's assertion is she doesn't think that matters because that's not who his campaign, who Mr. Polyev's campaign is targeting. Uh, the campaign is targeting the, the 23 year old, you know, typically, you know, not necessarily exclusively males, obviously. But if you you look at who his most ardent supporters are, you know, they get a bad <laughs> the, the cryptocurrency gets a bad name. You could argue deservably so. But the so-called Bitcoin <laughs> bros. Right. And and, the Bitcoin yeah. bros. <laughs> and this and, and, and if you can get enough of those people, as Supriya says on Friday, you can get enough people that typically wouldn't even turn out to vote. You don't need the moderates anymore. You, right. But how reliable are those are those demographics? Right. I mean, that's yeah. kind of the problem that Jagmeet Singh ran into with Gen Z, where he's super popular on TikTok, but really can't seem to translate that into into votes. Sorry to cut you off there. Erica. No. Oh, no. Go, no, you bring up a good point. And um, but here's the thing. The affordability crisis will make fewer moderates of us all. Hmm. I'm just that is let, the point. I'm just going to let that simmer for a second, Erica. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Hey, listen, you're, you're you're on pace, Erica, to become the first Real Talk guest that's ever joined us for a full fucking hour. Uh, but 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 I but I got we got to get to Mo's assessment of who's going to replace John Horgan and what's going on in BC and all oh, that. Yes, but but yes. we're but we're I, not. I, oh, do you want to just? Okay, we'll just hang. We've never done this before. I love it. Just hang out with us. Let's but do Erica, it. But Erica, before we do, before we do, yeah. because I don't want us to overlook this. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned bill. you're the founder the bill of C twenty seven. Seven, yeah. Yes, uh, you're the founder of, of Not In My Color. People, people can read your uh, work at notinmycolor.com. We were just talking about Mr. Uh, Minister Champagne, who's uh, the innovation minister. He's been uh, talking to, obviously, the telecom giants this week, uh, trying mm -hmm. to get accountability for Canadians. But but he is uh, one of the subjects of your recent column, June 22nd, where you assert that the federal liberals are on a collision course to entrench anti-blackness. Take us into it. What do you mean? So... The Minister of Industry, well, Innovation, Science and Economic Development, to be fair, um, introduced a bill on June on June 16th, uh, Bill C-27. It is what they call, it has to deal with privacy. So privacy, data, um, that kind of thing. There's an AI section in that bill. And the AI section is what I would call inadequate. It's a, it's, a it's a legislative framework to set up the regulations for AI. Um, right now, we don't have 
legislation or regulatory framework around AI. Now, the problem with artificial intelligence, AI, is that it has the tendency to deepen systemic discrimination and to spread it like wildfire at scale. And what that means is that, uh, for example, facial recognition does not identify dark-skinned people um, and non-binary people and trans people. It is usually um, incorrect. So let me give you an example. So let's say um, you're a firm that uses artificial intelligence to hire. Let's say you've, you've trained the machine on historically successful candidates, right? The, but your, most of your historically successful candidates due to patriarchy, racism, et cetera, have been male and white and have quote unquote Canadian sounding names. Well, once you apply that machine learning to new applicants, it's going to screen out um, I hate to use this word, but I will, ethnic sounding names um, and female names, right? And that's a way, let's say many companies use this same software, or maybe that becomes an industry, industry standard for how this software, this machine learning is used. So then we have a problem, right? Now with this bill, what this bill says is that if you're harmed individually, you can, you can appeal to the minister and basically they'll take care of it. Well, how would I know if I've been harmed, if I've been screened out of something, right? 